Hey, I'm back with Thoughts on Thursday, where I share what's been on my mind and you share what you think about it in the comment section below. Please like and subscribe, share, comment, click the notification bell to be alerted when I post videos because sometimes I might take like a three week break from doing this and then you are like, why haven't I seen any videos? And you look and they're not there. And so now you don't have to think about it. You just see the notification bell and say, hey, there's a post on a, on a video finally, or on a video of a video finally for Thoughts on Thursday, because sometimes I uh, need a break because I do have a 40 hour a week job and things happen. And sometimes it's, it's a lot to try to summarize these lectures and take notes and um, that kind of thing. So I appreciate your patience as I took a little bit of a hiatus, but I'm back with lecture eight from the Great Courses Plus, not a sponsor. The Rise of Communism from Marx to Lenin, and this is titled World War I as a Revolutionary Opportunity. Before I get into it, I'd like to do a quick shout out to Rob Orion, who I think it was like lecture six that he posted a very long comment about his, his views of Marxism, and we had a little bit of a back and forth, and it was great. And that's the kind of dialogue that I want to have on here, guys, on this channel. I, I love, you know, people to say their opinions, to disagree politely, or politely, <laughs> respectfully. Um... And, you know, share ideas, share views on some of this stuff that we're going over, because that's just great. And I think that people need to share their views and to know that there is more than one view and there's many views and there's good ideas, bad ideas. But, you know, like everybody has ideas for a reason and comes from a place mostly, I'm going to assume, a place of, of good. Um... And if not, then, well, you know, then you'll find out about those people when they're sharing their views. But I think everyone needs to to be open about their views right now and have conversations. I think that's important, guys. So, Rob, thank you for that great conversation. Now we'll get into the lecture. Again, this is lecture eight. And Dr. Gabriel, uh, this Gabriel Lulevicius is the lecturer from the University of Tennessee. So the First World War is taking place and Lenin is on his historic train ride through Germany in April 1917. It's heavily guarded as it drives through war-torn Germany. During this ride, Lenin is working hard on his revolutionary ideas. Dr. Veyes says, quote, during this train ride in its huge consequences, we'll observe how political communism experienced a difficult birth. In the traumatic breakdown of civilization, which was the First World War, without which it might never have matured. Lenin called war an accelerator of history, and indeed, it is speeding his journey, end quote. Lenin is heading to Russia's capital, Petrograd, which was once St. Petersburg, but uh, built by Peter the Great, but it was changed when the war broke out to sound less German. World War I shaped our world and took 13 million lives, and the wounded were twice that number. It affected all areas of life, from government to economies to societies. Historians state that it had the first modern genocide against the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire. It had a transforming effect on socialism and communism. The split between the two would come about during the war. The war brought socialists into governments for the first time and the first communist regime in Russia. A civil war began between socialists and the more radical communists. Although a proletariat revolt hadn't come about, Lenin had speculated that a great war between capitalist powers might break out, which would be a crisis that he would use to his advantage. Remember in 1891 to 1892 when the famine broke out in Russia um, and then Lenin didn't want to offer them any help because he thought the crisis would bring about revolution. The famine was, quote, a progressive factor, end quote, according to him, proving his success in being hard-hearted. And I'm starting to feel that whenever I hear the word progressive, it usually means something stupid or annoying or potentially dangerous. That's my view. So what te uh, when tensions were mounting between governments, the Second International repeated its promise that they would help prevent a world war. A capitalist war would have workers killing workers, even though their class interests were the same, which meant war needed to be prevented. The socialists had a saying, quote, the rifle is a deadly weapon with a worker on both ends, end quote. In 1912, the German Socialist Democratic Party said that if war broke out, it would call for strikes to, quote, immobilize the war machine, end quote. The war ended up breaking the Second International and destroyed the ideology on internationalism, which surprised the socialists. The socialists would discover that their loyalties were divided. While they were socialists, they were also patriots, wanting to defend their own countries. It was only the Russians that held firm to the original plan. In all countries but Russia, 
the socialists voted for funds to be given to their national defenses, therefore voting for war, which they had originally said they'd oppose. These socialists called themselves defenses, feeling an obligation to defend their countries and workers from their enemies who they thought had attacked first. The SPD in Germany was very decisive in this. The biggest socialist group could have stopped the chain reaction if they had voted against war, but the German socialists surprised themselves and the German imperial government. The government were ready to arrest socialist leaders when war broke out, but ended up not having to. The German socialists were committed to fighting Russia. They hated Russia like Marx and Engels did. They wanted war with Russia, thinking that would be key to a revolution. Lenin was shocked when he found out the German SPD voted for war. He wouldn't believe it at first. He then denounced them as, quote, social chauvinists, not real revolutionaries, end quote. He called their leader, Karl Kotsky, a, quote, political prostitute, end quote. I'm familiar with those, but today we call them sex workers. It was then that Lenin decided he would be called a communist, not a social democrat. Lenin said, quote, the conversion of the present imperialist was into a civil war is the only correct political slogan, end quote. Jean, uh, Jean Jarez, a, social, a socialist in France, might have been a, quote, game changer. He was working for peace leading up to the war, but he was assassinated by a French nationalist afraid Jean would, quote, derail France's march to war, end quote. French socialists joined the government, quote, swept up by the emotions of the working class, end quote. One leader put it, quote, French workers would not have permitted French soldiers to shoot anti-war activists. They would have shot us themselves, end quote. Italy entered the war in 1915. Uh, before that, socialist Mussolini considered that war could be good for Italy and backed off his pacifism to, quote, argue for Italian entry, editing a bellicose newspaper with French subsidies, end quote. Mussolini then joined the war on the side of the Allies and began fusing nationalism and socialism, quote, a new ideology he called fascism, end quote. This would, become the, uh, this would come to power in Italy in 1922. Now, the crack that had begun in the socialist movement in the past had widened into a canyon. Debates between the differing sects of socialism came down to defensism versus defeatism. Quote, should capitalist states be defending by socialists or should socialists everywhere work for the defeat of their own states in order to usher in world revolution, end quote. A small group denounced defensism, including Polish revolutionary Rosa Luxemburg, who was active in Germany, and we will be uh, discussing her later in an entire lecture. She was an interesting woman. So she was fighting uh, against, or she was against the fighting and tried to get the soldiers not to fight and ended up being put in jail in Germany for trying to prevent the war effort. Karl Lebnek, as uh, was a comrade of Rosa's, also was against defeatism or defensism. Uh, he developed the Spartacus League with Rosa, named for the leader of a slave revolt in Rome. Karl was also sent to prison in 1916 for shouting down with the war in the streets. Italian Antonio Gramsci was also against the war and was a leader of a socialist left-wing group. He later became an author, quote, theorizing on hegemony as a form of cultural power and control, end quote. He helped found the Italian Communist Party and was arrested by Mussolini's fascist regime. His health declined and he died in prison. This is an example of those who were against the war in different countries, but those socialists who opposed the war were small. In September 1915, Swiss socialist Robert Grimm set up a meeting with his group in Switzerland. Only a neutral country could allow this to be done. In the US, the activists had to meet pretending they were bird watchers holding a conference. Uh, are there any bird watch cons today? I'm uh, imagining people dressed up in like anime style, but birds, like some kind of Pokemon or something. Anyway, three dozens had gathered for this meeting and Trotsky joked, quote, even after 50 years of Marxism, a few taxis were enough to carry the whole real socialist movement, end quote. During this conference, the war was denounced and imperialism and, quote, called for peace without territorial conquest, end quote. Lenin insisted on a, excuse me Lenin insisted on a more radical solution. He was the he was at the anti-war con too. Uh, he wanted the third an international to be created um, that was for the January the genuine revolutionary socialists. He wanted to move the imperialist war into a civil war. 
there's something wrong with people who want to encourage civil war and try to obtain to try to obtain their own uh, ideological outcomes. That goes for anyone watching who finds the idea appealing here. <laughs> he said that workers and soldiers should turn on their rulers and overthrow them. But the group wasn't into this idea. So he created the Zimmerwald Left Group, which only had eight people. Uh, how many offshoots of socialism was there going to be? And how many internationals for that matter? These people can't seem to uh, get their stuff together, right? So Dr. Reyes mentioned two people at this meeting in Switzerland that he felt important, Leon Trotsky and Karl Radek. We've talked about them before, but even I don't remember what about exactly. So <laughs> Leon Trotsky was a future communist leader. He originally was Menshevik against Lenin. He was a prominent figure in the Russian Revolution and uh, was arrested and exiled, but then escaped and moved to Vienna. There, Hitler would be found at the time uh, he was a, an aspiring artist. I did not know that Hitler was an aspiring artist. Anyways, <laughs> when the war broke out, Trotsky went to Switzerland and then moved to Paris. After the con in Switzerland, he was deported to Spain, but expelled from there and then moved to New York, where he began developing his theory, permanent revolution. Quote, that is contrary to Marxist theorists who saw different countries as necessary, necessarily having to pass through phases of development. First bourgeoisie, then proletarian. Trotsky argued that in one swift and continuing dynamic the working class could accomplish all these tasks in some countries, all in the context of a world economic system that was increasingly interconnected." End quote. Now onto Karl Radek. He joined the socialist movement in Poland and was active in the revolution of 1905. He moved to Germany and was part of the social democratic press. I guess he, we met him before uh, at a showdown and he led a radical something, something, but I don't care right now. <laughs> Quote, he was famous as a journalist, conversate, wait, what? He was famous as a journalist, conversationalist. Um, how do you become famous as a journalist? I mean, as a conversationalist. That's interesting. <laughs> um, he was a compulsive joker and wore eccentric outfits. I'd probably hang out with this dude. Uh, I like to wear eccentric outfits too. So uh, yeah, so he was, quote, half professor and half bandit, end quote. That's interesting. Uh, that was according to his friends. He became one of Lenin's closest friends, which was a surprise to Lenin, I guess. These guys all went to the conference in the little village in Switzerland and would leave unaware of the historic paths they were, paths they were heading down. Lenin continued to wait, hopeful for revolution. He was impressed by the German war tactics and how it used industry some called war socialism. Quote, Lenin thought this might actually prove to be the basis on which socialism could be built after the revolution, end quote. Lenin wrote a book in 1916 called Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism, published in 1917. Quote, in it, he argued that finance capital had already created an integrated world system. The implication was that a revolution in a place like Russia, the weakest link in the system, might release a chain reaction globally, end quote. Lenin was working on state and revolution. He explored what he felt would follow an uprising. Quote, any state, Lenin wrote, was the centralized organization force, the organization of violence. And the working class would need such a state to enforce the dictatorship of the proletariat before that state would become unnecessary and wither away, end quote. In this writing, Lenin made another surprising revelation. He compared the future of socialism, fully developed, to a post office. Uh, yeah, he said the post office was a, quote, mechanism of social management at present capitalist, but able in the future to be repurposed under workers' control. Lenin concluded our immediate object is to organize the whole of the nation economy, national economy on the lines of the postal system all under the control and leadership of the armed proletariat. This is such a state standing on such an economic basis that we need, end quote. Um, I had to laugh when I heard that he was thinking, uh, when I heard this, because uh, I was thinking about our country's postal system and how everyone's, everyone was freaking out, you know, about mail-in ballots. 
stuff getting lost in the mail and, um, you know, just the mess that we're in right now. But Marx and Lenin were not psychics, obviously, to see that there could be chaos in the Postal Service as well. Um, I didn't mean to say Marx. Like Marx. <laughs> like Marx, who was not a psychic. Lenin, too, was not a psychic. So Lenin thought parliamentary democracy was a sham. He was attacked for being un-Marxist and anti-democratic by the German socialist Kautsky. Lenin didn't give a crap. Lenin's wife said, quote, Lenin was a wolf in a zoo so restless and wild, end quote. Sounds like she was into that. But after all the hoping and waiting, Lenin became discouraged. In January 1917, he gave a talk to Swiss social socialists in Zurich, and he said, quote, we, the old people, perhaps won't survive until the decisive battle of this forthcoming revolution. But it occurs to me that it's with a large amount of confidence that I can articulate the hope that the young people who work so wonderfully in the socialist movement of Switzerland and the entire world will have the happiness of not only fighting, but also winning victory in the forthcoming proletarian revolution." End quote. Dr. Weiss says this was huge. Lenin and Marx always said the revolution was imminent, but it now seemed the war would go on forever and put off the revolution. But again, not a psychic. Lenin was wrong as a month later, Russia was thrown into revolution. The February revolution is what it was called. The Swiss exiled Russian revolutionaries were so excited at this news. The Russian war took out a lot on the Russian society. The fighters were not well equipped and even were at the front lines without rifles. It was so bad an official commented on quote, whether it was from stupidity or treason end quote. In 1917, there were 5 million casualties. Some people blamed the weird mystic Rasputin, who was a confidant of the, Tsar's, of the Tsar's wife. He was assassinated in 1916, but that didn't seem to help any. The people went on strike, and then revolution took place, starting with women protesting in the streets. In late February 1917, troops were supposed to go out and stop the women protesters protesting for bread, but then ended up joining them, and more followed. The revolution spread, and the empire lost authority. The Duma formed a provisional government, and the Tsar abdicated, ending Romanov rule. Now Russia seemed to be a democracy, which made the U.S. and Britain happy. Change didn't happen quickly, since the provisional government wanted to wait for the for elections. Therefore, they stayed in the war. The Soviets revived and tried pushing more radical policies. Lenin was going crazy, wanting to get back to Russia, but the countries at war uh, surrounded Switzerland where he was and travel back would be difficult. Uh, but Lenin said, or travel there to Russia would be difficult. But Lenin said, quote, he'd be willing to travel to hell and back. Wait, and Helen, sorry. <laughs> he'd be willing to travel to hell to get back to Russia, end quote. He came up with a plan to be, be, okay guys, listen to this. So he came up with a plan to be a disabled Swedish man who couldn't speak. Um, I think that would be considered cultural appropriation. So he'd get a fake passport and be able to travel to Russia in this disguise. His wife thought this plan would never work because she was probably smarter than him, but also she was afraid he'd shout in his sleep about the Mensheviks and get caught. <laughs> so um, that leads me to believe he must have been a sleep talker. Okay, so that plan was nixed. There are discrepancies as to who came up with the idea to go to the Germans, maybe Karl Radek or Alexander Parvis, but the Germans did reach out to Lenin. They said they'd escort him to Russia if he would, quote, spread his message of Russia leaving the war on your return, end quote. There were negotiations and Lenin really wanted to use the Germans, but didn't want to be tainted as a spy for them. Lenin and his group set up, quote, so many conditions to maintain deniability that the German diplomats complained it was, it was as if they were the ones asking permission, end quote. But an agreement was finally reached, unlike the COVID relief stimulus package we're waiting on right now here in the US. And Lenin and 30 of his revolutionary bros would ride the quote sealed train and quote across Germany, but it wasn't really sealed. There were just chalk marks on the floor to separate the Germans from the Russians. Lenin's car would be a no trespassing zone. Quote, this was one of the key turning points in Russian history end quote. Lenin was very strict on this train ride because he was Lenin and quote on a mission end quote. Lenin threw the German socialists trying to catch a ride off the train. Another German socialist wanted to come aboard and say, to, say hi, but Lenin said that if he did, quote, they would beat him up, 
end quote. <laughs> this kind of sounds like Antifa, guys. Or Antifa. I always say Antifa. 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 Anyways, Lennon spent no time meditating uh, on what was about to happen or resting or playing cards. He worked, of course. He was reading and writing and talking about strategy. His comrades drank, partied, and sang a French Revolution song. And I'd probably want to hang with those guys because they sound more fun, but no. Carl Reddick was there making people laugh with jokes, and Lennon lost his ish and dictated rules on everyone. A curfew, a quiet, and a smoking break regimen. Smoking was only allowed in the two bathrooms, which made it difficult for those who actually needed to go number one or number two. So uh, then Lennon made up a ticket system of who could use the toilet and when. Holy hell, this guy sounds like a psycho. Quote, some historians say that the centralized micromanagement that Lennon established on the train was an omen of things to come, end quote. It was a long ride to Germany and the Baltic Sea. I mean, it was a long ride across to Germany and the Baltic Sea. Once in Sweden, they relaxed. In Stockholm, Radek started to note Lennon's crappy clothes. He didn't feel it was very leader looking. So Radek pestered him into a shopping trip. So he got a suit and new shoes. Radek wanted him to get a new overcoat, but Lennon was over the shopping. He said, quote, he was going to Russia for revolution, not to start a clothing business. But what if he did start a clothing business? Radek didn't end up going to Russia with Lenin since he wasn't a Russian citizen. He stayed in Sweden to spread the good word of Bolshevikism. He met up with Lenin in Russia a uh, half a year later, and to his fashionista chagrin, Lenin was still wearing the same pants he bought with Radek in Sweden. Quote, these were Lenin's revolutionary trousers picked out by Radek, end quote. On April 16th, 1917, Lennon arrived at the Finland station. He was met with a welcoming band playing the French Revolution song. Lennon, of course, didn't appreciate the fanfare. He wanted to get to work. His fans lifted him up on top an armored car. There he announced his April thesis. Quote, no support for the provisional government, peace and land, end quote. Seven months later, he and the Bolsheviks would take power, quote, starting a regime that the world would never see before, end quote. The end. Four more, guys. Four more lectures. And now it is time for Communism and Socialism in the News. So you know what's gross? Um... The deception, misinterpretation, gaslighting, and censoring of information from the mainstream media and social media. Did anyone else watch all three plus hours of the Senate hearings of Google, Facebook, and Twitter? Or was it just me? Yeah, that's what I do. I have fun. Um, Jack Dorsey seemed to be high. Mark Zuckerberg continued to look and act like Data on Star Trek and uh, Star Trek The Next Generation. Google's uh, Pichai... I think they were pronouncing it Pakai. Anyways, his name has the word chai in it. And that's the only thing I think or know about that guy. Uh, but yeah, that was really interesting. And I'm not going to talk about that, though. I'm going to talk about something else. I'm going to vent a little bit, guys. Um, I'm going to vent about the media, the mainstream media, or as Jericho Green calls them, the mainstream mediocres. Check out his channel. He's hilarious, guys. Jericho Green. Um, I'll, maybe I'll put a link below to get to him. He's really funny, but, uh, you know, I know people don't have a job like mine where I can torture myself for eight hours listening to media. I do my little, um, you know, Google list of, of news in the morning. I know I've talked about that before. And then I listen to a lot of independent journalists and try to, to like go back to listening to podcasts and then like, what's going on now? I'm just, my mind is so focused on all this stuff going on right now, guys. Um, and I'm going to reiterate the importance again <laughs> of being aware and doing your own research and forming your own opinions and not just living in, you know, um, living in the world of what the media is trying to portray. And, uh, you know, it's like looking at what's going on, there's like several different realities taking place. So there's, if you're watching just like CNN, 
the world is is crazy and um you know like uh trump is is trying to form a coup and you know there's no evidence whatsoever of any kind of things happening with the election i don't necessarily want to say fraud um and at the time that i'm recording this it's been like a week out since the election maybe a little, a little over a week actually and we're not really sure the media is sure. The media says Biden is president, but the media is being very irresponsible. And it's very frustrating because, again, like I said, there's different realities everyone's living in. They're living in a CNN reality or they're like on the right where it's like diehard Trump people. They're like, yeah, anything, everything to keep Trump in power. And then there's the independent journalisms and the people who kind of just are like looking at both sides and forming an opinion. And honestly, guys, to me, it's hard not to form an opinion against or like condemn the left a little bit more for some of the things that are going on. And one of the things that I think is is frustrating is how the media is kind of setting things up by saying that there's, you know, there's absolutely no evidence that there's any sort of, again, not going to say fraud, there may be some fraud, but um, some, what's the word I'm looking for? Just, just things that went wrong <laughs> in the election process um, that may not be fair or right. And, but there is evidence. There's lots of evidence. It doesn't lead to proof, but there's evidence out there. There's lots of video footage. And again, this may not be 100% proof, but it is evidence. So you can't say that there's no evidence when there actually is evidence. And there's like tons of signed affidavits of people that are confessing to seeing things not right at the you know, polls, polling, or not the polling, but the, um, during the, the ballot counting and all that stuff. So, uh, and even, even Fox News, I'm going to lump them in, guys, even though they're like considered right wing or whatever, to have them, it's just getting weird everywhere. And again, if you spend a lot of time, like I do, listening to all these sources and just seeing these weird inconsistencies, and especially with Fox, with them freaking out about Kaylee McEnany and her, what she was trying to say about stuff going on with the elections. Um, and then they like pulled away all scared, but then Tucker Carlson came on that night and was like, you can't just pull away from a, you know, a press conference or whatever, because you don't like what's being said. So it was like, I don't know, is there infighting going on? It's crazy guys. All I say, all I could say is, you know, these different realities, like I said, the CNN reality, the far right reality, the independence in the middle. And then there's people that have lives <laughs> that, um, uh, don't pay attention to the news all the time and they're doing their things with their families and whatever and they may not even notice that anything really is going on unless you know maybe they live in a in a, a suburb of Portland and see Antifa like stalking around or whatever um, and causing problems and then they, that would be bothering them but I think in general uh, a lot of those people aren't being bothered or noticing what's going on um, so yeah, there's lots of different realities going on right now and nobody believes the other person and no one understands and it's kind of a mess. And again, the mainstream media is frustrating to me because with them just saying, they say things over and over and over again to be like, we're just going to keep saying this. And maybe the more we say it, everyone's going to believe that it's real. So they keep saying that Biden won, Biden won, but that you have to say, okay, Biden's outcome looks like he is probably going to defeat Trump, but right now, there's some legal stuff going on. Trump has done some lawsuits. I think even if Trump doesn't win, I think the voter situation, what's happening needs to be pointed out for everyone to know that there may be a problem with our system. And obviously right now, a lot of people don't really trust the system and think that there's, I mean, they, there's a lot of stuff online that's saying fraud, fraud, fraud. So some people have that in the back of their minds, whether there was actual fraud or there was computer glitches or just inconsistencies, whatever the situation is. Um, yeah, and so I think that's irresponsible because I think if, if it, you know, does, it probably will go to court. Um, and then if somehow, because of, you know, recounting of votes or what finding out there was some things that went wrong and those votes didn't count or whatever the situation is and Trump ends up winning, people are gonna lose their freaking minds because the media has said this whole time that Biden won. So what are they gonna say? They're gonna say that Trump, took over. And they're also saying that tr Trump is doing a coup, guys, a coup. Like, do people know what words mean anymore? Do they understand what the word fascism means? Do they understand what the word coup means? Because I'm thinking to myself that, um, no, a military or a military coup, a coup. <laughs> I'm thinking that because of all the research I've done for the Middle East, for my book series, 
military coups in my mind. But I mean, that is one way to have a coup, uh, which doesn't look like that's happening right now. And a coup isn't somebody going about things in a legal fashion by contesting results of an election and going through the court processes and, and in the end having the courts determine what's happening um, and upholding the Constitution. So that doesn't look like a coup to me. And if it looks like a coup to you, well, I don't know if that's, you understand what that word means. Um, so yeah, everyone just needs to chill a little bit and just wait on what's happening because people are still counting even, guys. I mean, uh, uh, today, when I'm recording this, Alaska just released, or the press just called Alaska for Trump. And again, the press doesn't call who wins it, it biden hasn't even been certified as the winner i believe the electoral college hasn't even you know gotten all their information and whatever so um i think there's a lot that people don't understand and um so you just got to try to try to learn guys try to figure things out there's things i'm learning along the way in this process too but I, my main complaint right now is that i'm concerned about how the mainstream media is acting and trying to keep pushing a narrative and an agenda. And if it doesn't happen to go that way without them saying, because they can easily say, it does look like Biden's probably going to win, but, you know, that hasn't been certified yet that he is the president-elect, even though they keep calling him that. And um, we're waiting still on this legal stuff. So sit tight. We'll have this figured out. And there will be a peaceful transfer of power, which some of the politicians have been saying, even Biden said that it's going to work out the way that it's, you know, it always does. It may take longer, like Bush versus Gore. That took about a month to resolve, I guess. So, um, yeah, just everyone just needs to, to just have an open mind <laughs> to the situation. And then, you know, if we find that we can find who has won fairly and that, you know, that, that way, then that's fine. Whoever it is, it is. But, you know, we've got to go through the process to determine if things were done legally and in the right way. And, uh, you know, right now it looks like, you know, Biden's ahead, so he may be our president, but the media needs to just stop saying something that hasn't happened yet because he's not confirmed. So, and that's going to start some people losing their freaking minds if Trump actually ends up winning and the media has been saying this and they're going to say it was stolen. Either way, it's a mess. It's a mess, guys. I'm just, I don't know. I'm just venting. Let me know what you think. Um, I do have an article though, um, about a frustrating thing that has more to do with, you know, communism and socialism type things, more like 1984. So this is an article from Politico, and the title is AOC wants to cancel those who worked for Trump. Good luck with that, they say. And this was written by Ryan Lizza, Daniel Lippman, and Meredith McCraw. So over the weekend, people started making lists. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez kicked things off on Friday with a tweet that terrified Trump world. Quote, is anyone archiving these Trump sycophants for when they try to downplay or deny their complicity, complicity, complicity in the future? She wrote, I foresee, uh, I foresee dissent probability of many deleted tweets, writings, photos in the future. Is that really decent or dissent? Anyways, so yeah, so she, she, you know, thinks people are going to try to cover the fact that they were Trump supporters. I don't know. So a group calling itself the Trump Accountability Project sprung up to heed AOC's call. Remember what they did, the group's sparse website declares. We should not allow the following groups of people to profit from their experience. Those who elected him. Those who staffed his government. Those who funded him. Rarely a healthy sign in any democracy, the enemies list started to freak out some normally unflappable Trump officials in the White House. Quote, at first I brushed it off as ridiculous, but what is scary is that she's serious. The White House, end quote, the White House official of, um, said a White House official of AOC's tweet. That is terrifying that a sitting member of council is calling for something like that. I believe there is a life after this in politics for Trump officials, but the idea that a sitting member of Congress wants to purge from society and ostracize us should scare the American people. It definitely should scare the American people more than it scares me. The type of rhetoric is terrifying, or that type of rhetoric is terrifying when you have 70 million Americans who voted for this president. It might start with Trump officials, but what if they go further? 
So I'm not going to read this entire thing, but I just thought that that was ridiculous. Um, that she even would tweet something that's stupid. Okay, it's not ridiculous. It's not surprising that she would tweet something that's stupid. But seriously, making lists, like, what are you going to do? Just going to yell at them or shame them because they worked for Trump? And then are you going to shame people who voted for Trump? Are you going to, like, round them up and put them in some kind of camp where they deprogram you or something? I mean, that's just weird. Um, and totally, like, what? Anyways. Ugh. So that's what I got, guys. That's just frustrating. Tell me what you think in the comments about about this, uh, the account, Trump Accountability Project. I mean, do, do people really think that's okay? And then there's some like truth project or truth council, or I don't know what is similar to this situation. Um, but yeah, you can look that fun stuff up and you can, I'll put a link to this article so you can read the whole thing. I just wanted to share that that's just ridiculous that you would even want to make a list of people. Anyways. It's scary and hilarious. It's hilarious when you step outside of it and not, you know, think about that you're actually living in this crazy world right now. <laughs> but um, yeah, let's hope that there are people aren't going to be rounded up in the future. You know, I know I'm probably being overly dramatic, but um, I mean, where do you stop with these people? And these people think that this is okay, that people should be, I, I mean, again, I would like to know what they want to do with them. They just want them to, to shame them. They don't want to let them be hired anywhere, blackballed. Um, so they can't be their families and or work or I, I don't think that would happen necessarily. But still, it's the fact that and, and, and how is Twitter not thinking that this is kind of some kind of hate speech and take her tweet down? Of course they don't. Of course they don't. Because it's fine, you know, that you can make lists of people. Um, but yeah, it's anyways. So that's all I caught today, guys. Sorry if it went a little long on my rant, uh, but I appreciate you guys following me. And I thank you so much for your support. Got a couple more followers, slowly but surely I'll be growing my channel. I am trying to reach a thousand followers by 2021. We'll see if that happens. If not, that's fine. I just enjoy you all that are here listening to me. And remember, these thoughts are my own. We may not agree, but I still love you.